Fellow tennis nerds, I hope all is well. It's a morning here and I'm with Ashley Neves, my buddy, who is also the tennis mentor. He's an award-winning coach, growing social media platform. You should subscribe if you're not already. I know we have a lot of interlinking uh, people on our platforms. He's also now released a course uh, called the Bulletproof at the baseline with David Samuel. So that's pretty exciting. Liam Brody's coach. Uh, but first of all, how are you today, Ash? Very well. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a, it's been a while. Um, I know we've been trying to get this thing sorted for a long, long time, but um, at my fault, I've been trying to set up this office and had loads of Wi-Fi issues, but um, we're here and I'm, I've been watching all of your other episodes and absolutely love them. A little bit nervous about what you're going to ask me, um, but uh, yeah, really, really looking forward to it. So, so massive. Thank you. Yeah, I'm one of, one of the guys with hard hitting questions. I'm going to start like, how did you cheat your, your students in coaching today? <laughs> <laughs> it's 60 minutes here. No, no, no. So, so, I mean, I, I know you're a very busy guy and yeah, you do amazing content. Your production level is also always top notch, but you also coach still like, is it 30 hours a week? Yeah, roughly. I mean, it, well, I was at 40 hours a week, um, a few months ago. But obviously, with, with all of this stuff, as you know, the editing, the filming, it, it takes time. So I, I've slowly dropped down to about 30 hours. Um, and I'm at a stage now where I still probably should do do with dropping a few more. But I, I love that side of my my life so much. Um, you know, I am, I'm a tennis coach at heart. And the content stuff is, is a bit of a, a, a side hobby. It's become a bit more of a job recently. Um, but yeah, the coaching side, I definitely don't want to lose that. So it's it's tough finding that balance at the moment really yeah you, i think you feel that when you watch your content that you're like you're you're a passionate coach you're passionate about teaching players of all level you work with felix Schmischke before we get into that and uh that, that's your heart but you're also like you're really getting into the production side of things and working with different brands and uh, last year i think you were, were on a lot of events right so you're meeting pros alcaraz and everything like what, what were your highlights from last year's tennis oh i mean l- last year was incredible and, and i would say this this content creation thing some days i love it and other days i don't like it so much and and the the thing about last year was the the opportunities that i had i'd never dreamed of being able to do things like that you know going to new york which i actually didn't think i would ever get the chance to do um you know i'm busy on court being a coach so getting the time off work is is tricky but when these opportunities come up it's really tough to say no so yeah highlights um new york has to be up there um the, the tournament itself was incredible us open um very very different to the other the slams that i've been to i've been to uh, wimbledon the french and um yeah it was it was hectic it was it was crazy in a good way um and yeah me- meeting some of the pros there so i was working with head at, at the us open and i was working with sense arena so the actual reason i went there was i was um the host for a, a big launch event between sense arena which is the virtual reality um, headset training tool. Um, they were doing a big launch with the ATP tour that they're now partners. So I was the host of this event and I was, um, you know, asking the sensory team questions along with some players, Casper Rude and, um, and Dasha Seville. So that was really, really nervy for me because I've never done anything like that before. Um, and, and then I got to meet Lorenzo Mazzetti, uh, Rublev and some other head athletes through the head activations that they had. So that's got to be up there. Um, Meeting you, I, I think um, I met you for the first time um, early on uh, last year. We did a couple of events together. Um, and yeah, I think one of the massive positives to, to doing this social media is getting to, to meet cool people like yourself. Yeah, I agree. I think it's really nice when you go to the events that you actually have other <clears throat> content creators there. Otherwise, you could feel pretty lonely, I guess. Like it's you and there's, you know, pro players that are used to like people just pestering them all the time. <laughs> and you don't want to feel like a pesterer either, right? So that gets complicated and then yeah paris was really cool uh head event there talking about head actually one of the videos you did and you did several videos on this you went there to test the rackets using their their quite advanced system how was that that was awesome um I, i've worked on smart courts before so at our club we've got a smart court called wingfield which is um, at a basic level it gives you um, the speed of your shots the height of your shots over the net average rally length that sort of thing so it's, it's really cool but the Trapman technology is is really really advanced in the way that it picks up the um, the spin, the revolutions on the ball as well, um, and that was really really insightful. So I got to test um, the two upcoming frames. Uh, one of them's already been released, the Speed Range um, and the Boom line as well, which is soon to come out. And um, basically, I was testing each of the the rackets from the lineup um, against each other. Um, it was basically the, the pro player treatment. So when a, when a pro athlete goes to test their new frames, um, they will 
you know, have them tested. That they'd be blacked out, so they didn't know what specs each racket had, um, mm-hmm. so that they could really test them properly without having any preconceived ideas of, of how it's going to feel. Um, because Head were videoing my testing, they didn't actually black out the rackets. They wanted people to see the, the frames, um, but they did throw me the rackets um, randomly, so I didn't know which one I had in my hand. Although I could feel, you know, which one was heavier. I could feel which one had a slightly smaller head size, that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, it was, it, it kind of, it really fitted in with how I expected the rackets to go, which is good because sometimes you can think that the marketing could be a bit gimmicky and, and you know, they can promote these new technologies. And as you know, most of the time, these new technologies are only very, very subtle. Um, but I could definitely feel the differences between the different uh, head sizes and the, and the different string patterns and, and that sort of thing. So it was an awesome experience. Yeah, it's cool that they do these things. I when I went there before, I, they talked to them about like when Rublev came, like he came from the Wilson racket he used, six one ninety five, and he wanted a racket that's obviously similar, but that maybe a little bit more forgiving. And then you get that kind of blackout thing where you have like a bunch of rackets. I know Novak when he switched was also like twelve rackets all blacked out, just like a sticker marker. So that's that's pretty cool. You got the pro pro level treatment. So what do you think about like when you're traveling around and now you're working more and more with, with the ATP tour? Uh, what do you see as like big potential then like improvements for tennis in general but also things that are we already doing well as a kind of a sport or an industry really good question i mean we could probably talk about this for, for hours and, and chat through but <laughs> sure. i think i think te- it's always been really really difficult to to market tennis to the wider audience you know you've got the avid tennis fans that that do sit down and watch all the grand slam events and and watch tennis um i think it's really difficult to watch tennis on television um, it's not very accessible, uh, and that's been a problem for a long, long time, many, many years. Um, so that that's one thing. I think um, they've experimented a little bit with different scoring formats, which I, I, I'm one for. I love the traditional format. I think it really um, is exciting to watch with, with the fact that you can always win the match no matter how far down you are. But I do think there's a place for these shorter formats like the UTS um, and, and other like um for the products um i think also with social media being so prominent in the world i think they could do a lot more to to kind of get to know the the players on the tour a bit more off court i think breakpoint really tried to do it how successful that was is a different matter i don't i don't think it was as good as it could have been um i did like i don't know if you saw the the atp video that they did recently and pretending that the, the pros were all actors uh, i like that little um you know, fun skit that they did. Andy Murray was great in that. So more fun things to get um, people involved. But one really cool thing, I actually met with um, one of the guys from Hawkeye recently. And something that the Hawkeye technology have done recently with the NFL is they've used their skeletal um, tracking system where you, they not only track the ball in flight and, and the data from the ball, but they track the the limbs on the athletes. And they actually reenacted um, a Toy Story scene. So all of the NFL players were characters from Toy Story in Andy's bedroom. So they played out um, uh, an American football match on Andy's bedroom with Buzz Lightyear and Woody. And I think, you know, there could be some fun things. You, you've shown on your channel actually a few things that were done. It wasn't done so great on the, on the tennis court. But I think if we can get more kids to watch tennis, that would be a big thing because all the kids that I coach do not watch tennis. And I know when I was growing up, I used to watch tennis all the time. You know, I had my heroes that I would watch and try to copy. Uh, and nowadays, kids unfortunately don't really watch it. Why do you think that is? That's interesting. I also noticed that. I think they watch YouTube. So, I mean, like, I'm sure you get the same. Like, I can go to a tennis court and then people are like, oh, you, you're the tennis nerd. I watch your videos. And I'm like, okay, well, it's better you watch some ATP tour tennis. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, like, you know, that's, they're so used to the new media. And then everything that is, like, very slow, and I guess tennis can be slow, it gets, you know, it, it's too boring. It's not, not exciting enough for them. I, that's my guess, you know. And I remember I used to watch like French Open when I was like eight years old and be like, oh, you know, could watch for three hours. No problem. You know, I, I wasn't even that. So it's, it's a strange thing. And, and when you notice that, what do you think it's because it's it's too of a slower format tennis? Like it's too slow matches or what, what can be improved? Yeah, I think if you look at kids today versus kids when we were younger, um, our brains are evolving and, and through technology and um, iPads, the, the attention span is so short. So um, I think, yeah, something needs to change with the way maybe matches are edited. Um, 
you know, when I film a practice set, it might be 40 minutes um, of footage. But once I've clipped out all of the, um, you know, the seconds between points, it's actually like six or seven minutes, um, you know, and I'm still out of breath. But um, it's, I think the way that the matches are edited and, and posted afterwards would be a good, a good thing. Um, yeah, highlight reels are always more exciting than the full matches for kids. So more of that sort of thing. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah, because you lose like it's something I think it's been my topic on so many podcasts is like the, the issue with highlights in learning tennis and understanding a tennis story and what's happening if someone is choking or if someone is building a lead and, and then just taking domination stance straight from the get go. And you don't get that from highlights. You just see like really cool points, you know, and it, it is that kind of TikTok aha feeling to it. But you don't really get to understand the sport. And I think the sport maybe it looks cool, but it doesn't sell like the storyline of the sport. I think that is an issue with it. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, you mentioned Felix. So when I was working with Felix, um, before working with him, I would watch his videos. So I kind of knew him as a player from the, the, the footage that I'd seen on his channel. But when you see him playing in the flesh, um, you know, and if I wasn't at a tournament with him, when he would send me the full match footage, it was very, very different. And, and so there were lots of areas outside of what you would see on the channel that would need to be worked on. And, and like you say, you can't really see the ebbs and the flows and the momentum swings on um, a short video. So it's really tough to get the balance. And I'm not too sure what the answer is, but it definitely needs to be more exciting and more accessible for younger kids because they're the future of tennis. Yeah, I, like you mentioned, I think I talked about that in a recent podcast. It's like how when you edit out the fluff with Karoo, like it's like just the highlights being able to edit out the fluff makes them so much more digestible. Like, I mean, you, you have software like Swing Vision that cuts out the, the stuff in between the points, which, I mean, some might argue, I got some comment about that, like, oh, it's it's cutting out some of the tension, some of the drama because someone is taking a towel break or he's angry or something. Yes, I get that. But for like a highlight or getting an understanding of the match, you can still watch pretty much all points in a set. And like you said, in, in, a, in a few minutes, it's not that long, you know, because a tennis point is like usually around four shots, right? So it's pretty short than the next point, the next point. So I think something could be done with that. Maybe we build like more in drama around the scoreline, like oh, now it's 40 all, you know, and then the, the points matter more, you know. There was a guy, I, there is a guy I think who has this idea, which I'm not fully agreeing with, but it's like you start from 30 all. Uh, 30 old tennis but it's that's makes it even more short to me to be too short i think if you have to play like three points you know yeah I, I use that format quite a lot for um you know creating pressure so for training um starting at 30 all is quite a good way to to get players to think a little bit more um a little bit differently when they're in those pressure points because although every point is as important as another point at juice and 30 all you know or, or break point down it is different and, and you do have to think slightly differently when, you, when you're when you playing those big points. Yeah, it's true. It's actually maybe a good idea from that. When you worked with Felix, um, talking about that, like, what did you learn a lot yourself from that process? I mean, it's obviously he has a very different approach to a tennis career, like filming everything, uh, being a pretty famous YouTuber now these days, having a pretty big reach also outside, I guess, the most loyal tennis watchers, you know? Uh, so what did you learn from that kind of experience? Absolutely. So it's it's a slightly different package as a tennis player to, you know, a, a, a traditional tennis player that, that isn't filming all of their matches. And that does come with additional baggage because there are different forms of pressure coming in, external pressures that you wouldn't have if you weren't filming the match. Uh, Felix was excellent with, with that. Uh, that was one of my things when um, he first asked if I'd like to work with him. For, my first question was how how do you deal with the, the camera being on the court? Is it going to be a problem? Um, because if if the YouTube channel and, and the footage was coming first and the tennis second, then it, it wasn't something that I would want to get involved with because I'm, a, as I say, I'm a tennis coach that makes videos. So I, um, yeah, the, the tennis needed to be the priority and it absolutely was. Uh, and I think because he was involved in that, um, the, the YouTube scene from a very, very young age, his dad set it up when he was about eight years old. He was so used to having a camera on court that it almost wasn't there anymore. Um, the tough part was he was editing. So, you know, after a match um, between, you know, rain delays and that sort of thing, he would be sat editing his YouTube video for the weekend, which comes with positives and negatives. You know, the positive side being playing in these tournaments, there is a lot of downtime. Um, it can be it can be boring. It can be tedious. It can be tough. Um, and so having that extra um outlet was a really positive thing because it kept his mind engaged it almost 
was helped him with his um, analysis of the match as well because he could break things down, areas that he would watch back in the footage, see weaknesses to work on for the next one. Great. The downside is um, it adds that pressure because, you know, he knows he's going to get an awful lot of people watching that video, um, you know, more so than any other player on the challenger circuit. You know, there's not a lot of people watching those matches. So he's a, he's a mini celebrity in that regard. And so it did come with positives and negatives, but it was a really, really cool experience for me working with somebody of that level. Again, I mean, I, I started my coaching journey working with performance players, you know, um, a bit younger than Felix, but playing at national and international level, junior grand slams. But nowadays I'm a lot more working with club level players. And so it was a re it was really nice bit of variety working again with somebody on the Futures Tour. Would you want that to be the next step for you? Do you want to go back to more competitive play or you prefer uh, kind of the more grassroots? Like, I mean, what, what you're doing as a, as a coach that's also kind of a very visible coach is, is kind of heartwarming in a way because you're bringing tennis and helping players enjoy tennis more. Because, I mean, as, as you, we, I always worry for the sport. Like, I mean, not that the sport is doing badly. It's doing pretty fine. But, but you hear these stats and you're like, oh, you know, I wish more people could find the beauty in the sport because it's a difficult sport to start with. Like pickleball is easy to pick it up. Paddle is easier as well. And a bunch of other sports. While tennis really, if you have a good coach, it's going to help a lot, like to, to, to enjoy it just after one year. Definitely. I think um, sometimes tennis programs can work a little bit backwards in that way. So often the, the highest level coach at a club is working with the highest level players and the least experienced coaches in the club are working with the youngest, newest players. Um, and I understand why that happens, but the downside is you, you want your experienced coaches starting these young kids off on their journey in the right way. Um, and sometimes if you can get young teenagers who are inexperienced and don't really have a, a wide base of knowledge to help these young kids, they're super enthusiastic and they're you know really good to get them engaged. That's one good thing, but sometimes they can they can um, start to develop bad habits. And so, you know, when these more experienced coaches pick them up, there's a lot of undoing to be done. So, um, what we what I try to do in my program is is have a bit of a mixture. So the the more experienced coaches aren't just working with the stronger players, but they're also you know going down with the tops and the red uh, under eight players um, to really help them to start their journey well. So. Um, it's twofold. One thing is is keeping the kids coming back every week and making it fun. And that's what these newer coaches can do because they're super enthusiastic, um, but also starting their journey right when it comes to what they're learning on the court. Yeah. Are there any kind of cheat codes that we can do as coaches or as tennis uh, content creators or players in general to make tennis a little bit more easy, I mean, easy to engage with as an early player, like on an early level that you've come across. I mean, you've won awards as like the young coach of the year, you've won a coach of the year in the UK. So I, I would go to you for this answer. So I think my number one thing is to try to get competition involved as soon as possible in any form. Um, because what competition does, even for kids, some kids come to the court and they're not super competitive. Others you know, have siblings and they, they have grown up in a competitive environment. So I think involving competition in, at, at an early stage is great, whether that be with foam balls on a small court, whether that be a, a, an abbreviated scoring system, just a way to get kids um, pumped about getting on court and um, trying to improve. Because when a kid loses at the start, it's really, really tough, but it always creates a fire in their belly to improve and to come again. Um, as long as the competition is done in the right way, I've seen some, you know, some serious competitions um, done too early with kids and then they actually lose interest because they've lost every match and they've gone off court crying. So making competition fun uh, and accessible from an early age is really, really important because there's no better way to learn all of the skills in tennis than playing competitively playing a match. Um, I think starting off too technically um, can be dangerous as well because as coaches, if we can, if we give too much information to a player, they become reliant on us being there. And tennis is, as you know, a problem-solving sport. Um, you receive all sorts of junk on the court. Balls coming in from all directions and speeds. And so if a player has learned too technically, they might look great with their strokes, but they can't deal with adversity and they can't deal with the junk that gets sent to them. So um, trying not to be too technical, trying to expose them to as many situations as possible from a young age. If you go to older players, like the older players you coach that are 
where, you know, intermediate players or maybe advanced amateurs. What are the issues you're seeing there? Like, I mean, some of the players I, I meet, they, they don't play any points at all. Some only play match play. It's some quite extremes, you know, all over the place. Some never work on their game or physique. They just go to, to play tennis as a, as a training thing. Uh, so what are you seeing? You're seeing some things with, that could be easily improved or some typical errors on that side as well. Yeah, as you say, I mean, it's a massive um, array of, of different things that go on. Um, and you're right, most people at our club, they're, they're, 90% of their tennis is they'll rock up, they'll step on court, they'll have maybe 30 seconds warm up and then they'll get into doubles. And, and um, they're all standing still at the net, not moving their feet. Um, and so it's, it's tr trying to get them into situations where they have to think and they have to move. So we do a lot of half court single stuff just because it gives volume, um, it gives them repetition, but it also encourages them to always be alert because when you're playing one on one, you can't sleep, you know. Uh, and in doubles, when you're at the net, players are just watching that ball go back and forth. Um, we also try to um, bring in low compression balls for the beginner adults quite a lot because rather than working on shapes of swings and developing technical skills, the first priority really needs to be how they read the oncoming ball and how they react to the oncoming ball. Because when, when we get a group of beginner adults, because they haven't played a hell of a lot of tennis before, uh, and some of them not even played many sports, they struggle to, to read an oncoming ball. And that's what tennis is. You're receiving a ball and you're sending it. It's not like golf where you've got a, a static ball on the floor. That, that's very technical because the ball is still. So you have full control over everything within your swing. In tennis, you have very little control over the situation. So um, the more exercises we can do with a live ball rather than a coach feeding um, a consistent ball um, can really help them to develop their skills. The tough part of that is getting the players to buy into it because they want pretty looking swings. Uh, you know, they want to look like Federer, they want to look like Serena, but actually the, the thing that's going to make the biggest difference to their game is can you read a funky ball coming towards you and get into a position that's going to allow you to have a consistent contact point. So really it's finding consistency within inconsistency. I 100% I agree. I think that's the one of the things I've talked about before as well. It's like using going green dot balls, using balls that are easier to use. But for some tennis is such a, I mean, probably mostly males, but tennis is such a macho sport. So it's like, oh, I have to play with the RF 97, the heaviest racket on the market. And I have to look like Federer and then half of the balls go into the middle of the net. And that's not tennis. Like tennis is playing like Daniel Medvedev. I mean, he has obviously perfect technique in terms of biomechanics in many ways, but it looks odd. Uh, but the balls come back in any pace, in any spin. Like you, you can't really face him, right? So it's better that people like, okay, the longer you can actually have a rally, the more fun it is. You know, it's not like about having a perfect forehand that goes bang into the corner. And I sometimes blame Roger Federer for this, like that he's created this, I mean, like tennis is supposed to be so elegant and beautiful and just like he's one of my, you know, my favorite player to watch. But also, I think he hurt a lot of amateurs, you know, inadvertently by just being so good, you know. So what, would you agree with that? Totally agree. Totally agree. Um, and like you say, Daniil Medvedev, he's very, very unorthodox. But the key is he puts the ball where it needs to be. And that's what tennis is. You know, if you can put the ball in the rectangle, in a position that's going to hurt your opponent, then you can win. It doesn't matter what your technique looks like. There are two, there are two reasons why um, I would look at technique. And of course, I actually am a very technical coach. Um, I try to avoid working on it um, unless it's really important. And the two reasons are injury prevention and efficiency. And, and you, you know, if you've got bad technique, as you know, we're reviewing lots of different rackets and, and balls as well, and strings. Um, if you're using the wrong technique, it can create problems down the line with tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, wrist problems, um, but equally inefficiency. And so with, with young junior players, there are times where we would um, intervene with technique and we do do technical work if we know that it's going to increase their ceiling because a certain um, technical flaw will create a, a limitation. And it might not be for the next couple of years, but we know as experienced coaches that, um, you know, somebody using a full Western grip as a, a mini kid that's maybe grown up using the wrong ball color. Um, they could deal with it now because it helps them to get the ball in that short court. But when they're um, on a big court using proper tennis balls and playing against bigger, stronger players, that full Western grip isn't really going to cut it. It's going to drop short. It's going to sit up nicely for their opponents. So um, yeah, 
injury prevention and efficiency really is the two reasons why we look at technique. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because it's all, all about balance in, in like most things in life, right? It's like some people get, I have a friend who's overly focused on technical things because he's kind of a new to 10. I mean, he's been playing for 10, 15 years, but he has not been like properly trained by a coach, you know? So he's, he's, he's trying to figure it out on his own, maybe one or two lessons here and there, but watching a lot of YouTube, uh, obsessing over technical stuff. And that kind of gets in the way sometimes of, of just, you know, f flowing and enjoying tennis on, on a merit of its like competitiveness. But then you also have the opposite guys that don't care at all about technique. They have, they're inefficient, like you said, or they might get tennis elbow, which is very common. And they just want to go and play matches and without any warm up. So there's no right, really focus on physical or anything. So I think like with everything you need to have like, okay, what is my fitness like? What is my footwork like? What is my uh, technique like? And then how, how do I act in competitive? Uh, things do you try to divide that up in certain sections like based on the player or do you try to kind of give a varied diet of, of different approaches to to the players yeah good question so uh, with my players that are playing in competitions we set goals um and the four goals uh the, the goals are around four pillars um technical tactical physical mental um and i think it's really important that all four of those are taken care of um as i say technical is very very important but it's actually it comes behind um, the physical, uh, the tactical and the mental, purely because um, if if I'm working with you, let's say, um, and I ask you to hit a forehand, um, if that forehand goes exactly where you want it to go, um, and you can do that from different situations on the court, then actually there's no need to change the technique unless I see an injury coming down the line, or if I see you know, later down the line, you're going to struggle to get the speed that you want at that higher level. Um, and so the tactical intentions are, are most important. If I ask a child to hit a forehand and that everything's going short, first, instead of trying to fix their technique to hit it deeper, I'll just ask them to hit it deeper. If they can hit it deeper, it solves itself. If they can't hit it deeper, then we may need to look at the, the technical side of things. Um, but the funny thing is, I think through my coaching career, I've, I've learned more and more and more. Um, I think my knowledge is increasing as I go on and it will forever. It will never stop. But even though I understand more, I think I'm telling my players less and less and less the more experienced I get. Um, and I'm trying to kind of cut down on the words that I use because I know that if I teach somebody something with lots of words, they're going to need to remember that. And that's not going to happen on the match court. You know, when they get tight, that's going to go out of their head. They, they're going to struggle. If I could teach a player to do something through feel, they can repeat that on the match court because they don't have to remember anything. They, they, they've got the feeling and they know how to find that feeling. So anytime I'm trying to intervene technically, I'll try to create an exercise that makes that technical thing happen without me explaining what they're doing and why they're doing it. You know, so um, it, it might be, uh, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head, uh, a forehand, um, a player is you know, opening their strings up on their, their backswing. So it might be that I get them to prepare with their strings down. I'll put a cone on the top of their racket and I'll get them big forehands. I won't explain why they're doing it, but they'll start to develop that pattern of movement without opening their strings up at the back of the swing. And so they're more likely to remember the feeling that they had or even the visual that they had of having the cone on their strings um, when they're playing competitively, as opposed to me going, right, you're going to have your wrist in this position. Your strings are going to be down, 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 down it's not achievable so for me as a coach i try to use as least as a few words as possible yeah i've also noticed that like i'm not a coach uh, i've coached my parents a bit and also other players before here and there uh, but but it's just like on, on lower level intermediate and i am a talker i mean obviously i'm doing a podcast and blah 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 blah. i even got a comment the other day which was very funny like you talk way too much three exclamation mark or something like that <laughs> I, I immediately screenshot these comments, um, which is probably true. But you, you over talk, you want to correct everything. You, you, you get so many thoughts in your head. You see things, ah, oh, but you can, you know, bend your knees or, you know, you have to do this or any kind of biomechanical mechanical thing you can spot. But then you realize this is not the way we absorb things, just like by hearing things. I think sometimes that's also over, like a bit exaggerated why people trying to learn through podcasts because you, you, you can listen to a 4,000 podcasts nothing in your life has changed you're just listening you know like in your head what might be better or you can verbalize it in a conversation but you're not actually absorbing it into your life so i think 100 percent correct what you're saying is that 
if you can learn through that person feeling what is correct or feeling the difference in the stroke or what it actually generates on the ball, that is the best way to learn. But I think it's like sometimes we are behind in that because everything wants to be verbal, you know, all the time. Yeah, I, and I do think there are there are different players. Everybody learns differently. And I would definitely say with, with junior players, um, I would use very few words. With adults, I would try to do the same, but there are some adults out there that really have technical minds and, and want to know everything about the shot. And I, I, just, I still mention to them, look, I'm not going to tell you all of this because your brain is going to be too full. And when you step up to the line to serve and you're thinking about, you know, your elbow position, your pronation, your follow through, your landing, it's just not going to work. But some adults want to know all that. So what I'll do is I'll give them all the information that they want to hear. And then I'll give them one thing to think about. Um, then it's on them to make sure that they do limit their thinking to that one thing. Um, it's, it's, yeah, I'm sure you've come across it. I mean, you're probably quite a technical person, I would imagine, with, with your, uh, your tennis nerd brain. How do you compute things when you're on the court and you're trying to learn a new technique? Yeah, that's tough. I mean, like, I think I've, I've tried to like read things, watching. I've realized that the best things for me, way for me to improve partly by pl is playing a lot of tennis. That helps a lot, obviously. Before, when I started doing videos, I was playing like once or twice a week. And my life was completely different. Now I'm playing five, six times a week with some good players. So obviously you see, you're seeing improvements and you're feeling better. You're enjoying it more. You can play with, with pretty good players uh, and play points and, and, and compete. But uh, it's more of the watching myself overall. So I watch videos, obviously, of good coaches. Like if I see something that, okay, I, maybe I can learn something from this. You, Nicola, there's a lot of good YouTube coaches out there, for example. And then I, I look at myself all the time. I think that's what I've learned the most. It's like recording myself. And like, oh my God, you know, because the perception in your head of what you're doing, and this is a Federer thing, like, and people think they look like Federer, and then you're, you know, if you're doing a racket consultation, I get always sent clips of the people playing, and they're playing with this super advanced racket, and I'm like, okay, and then I watch it, and I'm like, okay, well, you're an early intermediate player, you should not be playing with this racket, because it's like, it's going to really limit your progress, although you need to go to a coach, like, but, but my coach has probably been like the camera, the best, you know, in, in, in overall. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I mean, the camera is some a really underutilized tool and, and one of the most valuable. Um, my challenge to you for your next one then, when you, when you're next having it here to practice, better if it's a practice set, is film film the set and instead of looking at yourself, which everybody does, you know, looking at how the racket's moving and, and these things, just look at the ball and, and try to figure out is there any pattern, you know, is your forehand dropping short in a certain position, da da da. If there's a weakness in what the ball is doing, then look back at the technique and try to figure out which part of the technique is creating that. Because, yes, we all want to look like Federer and Sampras, but actually we could be even better if we look like Daniil Medvedev. You know, everybody's so different. And I think looking at the ball is something that not many people do when they're looking back at the footage. So that would be maybe something for you to have a go at next time. Yeah, that's a great idea. I, I even like, because, I, you know, instinctively, instinctively, I'm like an impatient you know, want to play like aggressive tennis, also a Fed boy fan, right? So, uh, but when I realized when I played some of these ITF tournaments, and we'll get into that, you know, it's like you, is that if I just put the ball back with good depth, you know, against players of my level, a little bit higher, a little bit lower, I have great chances of, of winning actually, because I can, I can run for a long time. So I'm pretty fit, right? So that's not a big issue, but uh, it's just like, okay, I'm going to put the ball back. I'm going to play like Novak. I'm going to try to make it a little bit, um, you know, he's obviously a genius in terms of where to place the ball, you know, breaking down their like weaknesses just piece by piece. Uh, it doesn't have to be that fancy, but it's more like, okay, ball coming back with good depth. That's it. And and that you, as a direct player, that's going to leapfrog a lot of players because like you're just putting the ball back. The problem is sometimes is that instinctively you have this style, wh whatever it comes from, I don't know, you know, and Mike, I blame a lot of Roger Federer, but uh, that is not true. It's probably like an impatient nature in me or maybe a nervousness to finish the point or something else, you know. Um, what do you think about this? Like when, when players have an instinct, an instinctive style, like is that something that is actually a style that comes from personality or is it something that comes from watching a lot of tennis or your favorite players or is it something else? Great question. Um, so firstly, I, I feel if there is something instinctive within your personality to play in a certain way, I think you should really lean into that and, and to use that as a weapon or a strength. Um, even at children's level, there are some kids that just race to the net all the time. Uh, yes, that might not be suitable for them when they're transitioning onto a big court and, and they're tiny, 
But in the long run, if if you think about the bigger picture and what they're going to look like as adults, I think it's definitely good to shape uh, a game around a personality, unless you know they're going to be five foot five, um, you know, and not it's not going to work. Um, it, I think it's a combination of um, character, personality, but also, as you say, external influences. So, you know, it could be a coach that influences that influences a certain game style. Um, I know um, there's a coach that I worked with a while ago that every single one of his pupils looked like him. And, um, you know, you knew if this player was coached by this coach by looking at the forehand and the backhand. Um, and so whether that was taught or whether that was, you know, he was just a great role model and the kids all copied him. Um, but that also has an impact as well. But I definitely feel if if there's a certain personality, some people are quite placid and mellow, um, you know, like to sit back and just use their opponent's pace. Other players are quite aggressive and fiery and want to get into the net and finish the point early. Now, I think it's good to lean into that because um, there's no point in fighting against it. It could become a real weapon. Good point. Very good point. When it comes to like, we talked about a coach getting players to all mimic him. Like, and that, that's, I think that's sometimes an issue in tennis. I don't know whether you agree, but it's like, a lot of players look the same. You see American college players tend to have very, very similar techniques. Now, like there's a, you know, becomes like, oh, there's Starbucks everywhere in any city you go to in the world. And now the every forehand and every backhand are pretty much looking the same. The one-handed backhand is so, slowly dying, maybe due to the games changing a bit. Uh, is that an issue? Because we like to have Medvedevs, we like to have Santoros, we like to have these kind of contrasting styles. It, it sells tennis in a better way. It, it makes it more engaging to watch. Uh, is that an issue that people now have all the same technique? Exaggerating, of course. But um, As you say, it, it doesn't make tennis as exciting to watch. If everybody was a robot, you know, it, it wouldn't be as exciting to watch. I think as far as quality of tennis and reaching your potential goes, I think if that technique has been developed through to maybe playing on a certain surface, um, you know, the Brits play a lot on fast surfaces, um, you know, so they do play, you know, their shots lower to the net. They've got great slice backhands. Lots of them can volley quite well. Um, I, I think if it's developed through playing on a certain surface and in a certain environment, it, it works well. I think if it's, if it's been done through copying a certain player, it could almost if it doesn't work with your physicality and it doesn't work with your game style, that shot can become quite hollow and not very robust, if that makes sense. And so I think um, if it's artificially created, it's not so good. If it's created, if a, if a, a certain style is created through playing on a certain surface, almost like Cam Norrie's backhand, that works so well on a fast court, you know, and, and probably through playing on lots of, um, you know, faster indoor hard courts, that's where that's developed from. But, it's actually lethal on lots of surfaces now. So yeah, it's an interesting topic. I, I, that's probably where I sit with it. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, the surface, obviously, I mean, like if you look at the Argentinian players, now there are two ATP tournaments in Argentina, right? So now in Buenos Aires, and you can see that the, the clay court player is obviously going to have a different technique to what a typical British player would be, what it would be like, or even a Swedish player who plays a lot indoors in, in you know, fast courts, get to the net, otherwise no chance. Like if you don't have a serve, you, you, you're smoked, right? While on a slow clay court in Buenos Aires, the serve is not the most important shot. It's like consistency and smarts, like that you actually can you know, have a rally for 20 shots and you're still the guy who comes up with the finishing drop shot, right? So uh, that, that's also, I think, one of the best things in tennis is that the contrasting surfaces, conditions, players, everything being like the tour, always, it, every, all of the things keep changing all the time, you know, so it makes it very exciting to be a tennis fan. Uh, would you agree with that? Definitely agree. Um... You know, it's it's kind of sad to see the the grass courts becoming more like hard courts and um, all of the surfaces almost kind of coming together. Um, I, I love the contrast because different players win events. Um, you have to problem solve. You have to adapt your technique. As you know, Rafa learned how to slice and volley to, to win Wimbledon. Um, and, and that takes a lot of a player that's grown up playing so many clay court events. Um and now you've got hybrid players, you know, players like uh, Alcaraz that can play all sorts of game styles. Um, so, yeah, I definitely think the, the more contrasting the surfaces, the better. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so in your coaching life, you, you coach a lot, you many hours a week. Do you ever get the chance to play any um, tournaments yourself? Like you played an ITF. We talked about that when we met last, but that was a long time ago now, or like a year ago or something. Yeah, I think it's two years ago now. Um, so I, I play very rarely. When I do play, I absolutely love it. Um, you know, it, unfortunately for me, 
when I play, I enter a tournament, rock up to the tournament and play. Don't I don't train for it. I just rock up and play. And that's not the best thing for my body. Uh, and also, it's not the best thing for my brain because I go onto court expecting to play like I used to. Um, but when I step onto the court, the adrenaline that I feel, it brings back memories and I absolutely love it. So I would love to play more. We've had a chat. You know, I, I think I would be keen to enter another um, ITF Masters event. I'm over 35 age group this year. So um, I'm definitely keen to do that. I've, I've only played one Masters event two years ago. Uh, I managed to win the tournament, but the final was horrific. And it was a, probably the most horrific experience I've had on the tennis court. You know, you you have um, through your junior days, lots of kids making dodgy line calls. That's expected. There's there's all sorts of stuff to go through. But um, when you play in the, the seniors ITF, when there's no prize money and there's nothing on the line, you don't expect adults to act like that. And it was, it kind of ruined the experience for me. I, I played this tournament expecting to have some fun and it was in my leisure time. And it kind of ruined it. So I haven't played for a couple of years, but I definitely want to to pick up the rackets again. Yeah, it would, would be fun to do one together. But yeah, yeah I agree. I, th- I've had some like up and down experiences with the ITF Masters like you. I expect like, okay, I've also played some like prize money tournaments. You, you get run into an ATP Pro, you're, you're trash, you know, like you get a bicycle, as they call it. Um, but you, when you play the Opens, okay, you expect people to be a little bit like there's some prize money, even if it's only 500 euros for the winner, whatever. It's, it's going to be, there's going to be some competitive players. They're going to be pretty, pretty ready to to compete. But for a non money price money tournament with people are plus thirty five or plus forty or older, you would expect none of that. You would be like, hey, you know, nice shot. Like this is the way I want tennis to be in my in my age now. But it's like uh, no, they, I've gotten some matches where I'm like, oh my god, like this the, the line calls are so bad, or like half of your line calls are questioned. So you need to like really circle. Like you're like this is worse than ADP. I have to circle like every ball, you know, on my side. It's it's tough. Like how do you like how do you train tennis players? Because tennis is like MMA with with tennis balls, right? So how do you train your players to be mentally strong and ready for this kind of um, you know adversity? Because it's quite tough to deal with for for many of us. It is, and unfortunately, whatever you do um, on the training court never really replicates what it feels like to be on the match court in a tournament. So. Um, we do tons of things, especially with the juniors. We um, we do games where they have cards, a little bit like the UTS. So a player could use the cheat card, right? So in a certain situation in the match, um, they could call a ball out that's in, no matter how far in the court it is. And they, they, but they have to claim their cheat card. They can't just hook their opponent. Um, and so they'll do this at a really tough time for their opponent, and it's a, a good test for their mental skills. And I, I would never advocate cheating, but this is just a fun way of doing it. So both players have one cheat card um, to use. So that's quite a fun way of doing it for the kids, but never really replicates what it, it what it's like on a match court. So it's really a case of just getting people to play more matches um, and to try to play more matches around the level that they're at. Because when they're playing people that are easy to beat, or if they're playing people that they're really um, struggling to win points against, there's no adversity. There's there's no chance of of that heat of the battle and, and the dodgy line calls but yeah where possible the more matches you can play of somebody of a similar level that's just the, the real best way to practice yeah i agree i think playing a lot of matches is that something you encounter also with with like older players like i mean my age or older but uh that they should play more matches so they don't play enough competitively or or is it the opposite that they should train more and not play so many matches good po- good question um i think there it's a bit split actually so if i picture players at the, at the club that i work at um, lots of them play uh, only matches. So they literally, like I say, they rock up, they warm up for 30 seconds and they play a doubles match. Um, and then they play for the club team. And so they're not really ever developing their skills uh, and their tactical understanding. They're just react, playing reactive tennis. They're just you know playing a match, enjoying it. And it's great because they, that's what they enjoy doing. There's other players that just use the ball machine and, and they just hit balls hours after hours after hours and never play matches. So they become very good technically. They're, they're robots on the court. But as soon as the ball bounces above waist height, they struggle. So I think it really depends on the player. And, and I think the balance, as you say earlier, is the key. And not many players find that perfect balance. No, it's, it's a good point. I think it playing playing competitively, at least from time to time, is very good for you. It's also tests you because I think a lot of players have the perception that they're much either much better than they are or maybe much worse, uh, but they, they don't 
like tennis is that competitive element where where things go against you or with you, you know, and, and you're just trying to get the ball back, you're hustling. It's it's a little bit it's not that kind of beauty contest, you know, hitting the most beautiful strokes. And uh, one thing I wanted to get into is also like you come from a, a tennis family, right? You have brothers which all look very good. Like I saw your reel uh, with your brothers also hitting forehands. Uh, you all seem to be very good players. Like how did you get into tennis and are your parents also tennis uh, players? So my parents aren't tennis players. Um, they were both fairly sporty. Um, I think my mum's sport was hockey. Um, and I was eight years old and they took me to like a summer camp just to get me out of the house, I think. And um, I absolutely loved it. Uh, and then from there, I played once a week, probably until I was about nine, ten years old, and then started playing a bit more, started competing. So it's fairly fairly late start, really. Uh, if you if you think about you know the kids that are doing really well today, they're starting at three, four years old. Um, and then I so I'm one of five boys. I've got four younger brothers. I was the oldest one, and I got to a decent level, not not a fantastic level, but I was playing um, a few ITF junior events and um, playing a lot of British tour events when I was kind of 16, 17 years old. Um, and because my parents were learning the ropes when I was playing, they didn't know much about tennis when I was in the competition structure. So I wasn't playing every single weekend until later on uh, down the line. Whereas my younger brothers, they all got a lot more into it. And my parents would, you know, drive them up and down the country to, to chase ranking points to the extent where it actually got, um, a little bit too much for them and so although they were incredible my younger brothers were incredible players um one of them the third brother um Maka, who's now a coach he was kyle edmund's age and he would he would play kyle edmund and beat him every single time um kyle edmund was a bit of a late bloomer whereas my brother started quite young and was playing tournaments every single week so that's why he would beat him and he was um you know, playing in national events and da da da, and he gave up by the time he was sixteen because of burnout. The next brother down, uh, Wilson, he was even better. He was Jack Draper's age, and he would play Jack every single national finals at you know nine and under, ten and under, um, etc. And he gave up by the time he was twelve. Um, and it just kind of, it, it's a really important lesson that I I speak to the kids that I work with and their families that it's really everybody's on a different trajectory and it's important not to get caught up chasing results and chasing rankings from a young age because burnout is such a common thing in, in tennis and any sport um and so the interesting thing is i'm the oldest brother i was probably had the least potential out of all of them but they've never beaten me um and it's because i have loved it throughout my whole journey and i've kept kept going whereas they've all kind of stopped at certain points they're both back in the sport now which is re really good um but yeah i'm not going to play them again because they probably can beat me now <laughs> <laughs> well that's a, it's a nice story it's a very i mean it's a good learning uh in, in that sense that it's like tennis is a burnout sport like i mean you see the pressure from parents is, is heavy like i mean not all of all parents but but there are a lot of toxic parents around in tennis uh, and that like individual sport where you chase ranking points from an early age you travel a lot, so there's a lot of cost involved. So you're not going with your team to a on a player bus to some event, you know, and having fun. It's it's a lot on you, your shoulders as a young kid. Uh, so so it's it's a very complicated sport to to deal with, you know. And you're seeing a lot of people, like young people, being already like at a, a high anxiety level around their passion. And like you said, what you, why you stayed is because you have an you know natural passion for it, you know. And sometimes it looks a bit forced. Uh, from parents or, or it gets too much, you know, connected to stress. Is that something you're seeing also in your coaching uh, career? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think um, if I start to see that with um, with junior players, then then I speak to the parents and suggest a break, even if it's a couple of weeks out of tennis, because the, the desire to play really does need to come from the player. Um, if it's coming from external factors, it won't work in, in the long run. And so, you know, taking a couple of weeks off when a child is young, yes, you, you might look at that thinking that's opportunities wasted and, and they're going to drop behind other players, but it's absolutely not the case. Um, you, you need the player to miss tennis. You, you want them to feel like they want to come to tennis every single day, uh, you know, whether that's dropping a session each week and, and doing slightly less to increase the longevity, then um, that's the key. And it, it's really those players that want to be on court and that want to be on court for a long span because Tennis is a long journey. It's not like, um, you know, other sports. Uh, gymnastics is a good example because I used to work next to a gymnastics centre where 
you need to peak by the time you're 18. Um, and so, you know, you can spend hours and hours and hours working on your craft because actually it's only four or five years and then it's done. Whereas tennis, you've got to be in it for the long game. And so it's really important to have fun on court. It's really to good. It's really good to get the balance and, and want to, to be there. Yeah, good advice. Uh, when it comes to your course, then we need to get into that as well. Um, your, I mean, your production level is is so high on your your videos. It's it's, it's great to see. It, it's a kind of role model for me. I need to up my game. Um, but I want to hear about like you working with another coach here, and also the semi you know famous one with with Liam Brody's as kind of background. Uh, so what is the course and and bulletproof at the baseline? What 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 does it mean? So. Um... I met Dave Samuel um, middle of last year. Um, he reached out to me via social media and um, got in touch. I went on court with him and Liam to watch him coaching and to kind of see what he's like as a coach. He he runs um, a program called the Mindset College and he's very, very good with training people, uh, players, you know, good athletes mentally and helping them to become more resilient on court and to improve their mental skills. So. He's been a, a real asset to, to Liam and his journey. Liam got into the top 100 at the end of, of last year. Um, and so he, he's a, a traveling tour coach, but he also works as a consultant for other players around the world. Um, so for me, it's it's been incredible to learn from him, somebody of, of such high caliber as a coach. Um, but yeah, we've, we've built this course together. It's called Bulletproof at the Baseline. Uh, and it's basically sharing my um, kind of technical and tactical knowledge and, and the experiences that I've had as a coach with his mental knowledge, but also knowledge of how professional tennis players train. And we've combined forces to build this course to help people to become bulletproof at the baseline. So the, the reason we've called it bulletproof at the baseline is is it's all encompassing with regards to being really solid at the back of the court, technically and tactically. Um, feeling confident in your game and having the competence level to be able to trust your game, uh, along with David's mental tips in how to translate that onto the match court. So uh, it's three modules. First module is all about consistency, comes with three drills that can uh, you can add to your training to really make you more consistent from the back of the court. Uh, the next module is about quality. So improving the quality of those consistent shots. So not just getting the ball in, but hitting with good depth, good tempo and good directional control. So that's another three drills. Um, and then that's followed up with David's uh, really cool game plan, actually, which is a game plan that I've not heard before meeting David. And it's a game plan that he uses a lot with his players. And it's it blew my mind when I first listened to it. It's so basic, makes so much sense. Um, and you could use it against any player. And it's a game plan that you can adapt. So you start with playing in a certain way, a certain tactic. And depending on how that goes, you mould your plan according to how it starts. Um, and, and yeah, he ties everything in together with this game plan. So yeah, really proud of the course we put together. I'm not, um, I've not, I've done one other online course, the Doubles Masterclass, which I did a long time. As you know, I'm not a very good salesperson, so I, I didn't really push that and promote that. Um, so thank you for bringing it up because I, I wouldn't have brought it up otherwise. Um, and yeah, we love people to get involved and um, yeah, to see what they think about it. Yeah, I'm sure it's good. I'm going to check it out for sure. And uh, your, your YouTube journey, like, so we both know, like, YouTube is a grind and it's a passion. Like, it's nice to create videos. It's fun to edit videos. But it's also something that is taking a lot of time. And sometimes you release a video and, like, you know, a quite significant reduced number of people are, are watching it than you had expected, you know, based on previous data and stuff. And it's very easy to get into analytics. And um, I always talk about Nicola being an analytics geek. He always like writes to me on WhatsApp, like I check this. <laughs> so it's quite fun. It, how has your journey been with YouTube? Like, I mean, you, you're passionate about it. Your your production is great, but but how has it been like on the overall? It's a grind, as you know. Like it's it takes so much more work, I think, than people realize. Um, you know, and for me, because I'm a bit um, picky with how the video looks, it, it takes even longer, which is my own problem um yeah i mean if i didn't enjoy doing it i would have given up after two weeks because you you don't get people watching your videos um you don't get any income it's just it's just you do it for the love of it and i think if if you're looking to start a youtube channel for any other reason um it, it you're probably not gonna carry on um as you know the views um 
to me, I, I used to look at them quite a lot. I tend not to now because it's not great for me mentally. Um, some videos do great, others don't do great. I don't care as long as I like the video and I feel that it's benefiting the people that do watch it. Um, I have set myself one goal. I just want that silver play button. Um, you know, that would just look really cool behind me. So that is the only number related goal that I have for the channel, which is you've got to reach 100,000 subscribers. And, what, you know, at which point in my journey that happens, I don't know. It's probably going to be a few years from now. Um, but at the moment, I'm just enjoying the creative side of, of doing it and, and actually engaging with the people that, that watch the videos. I'm, I'm truly grateful for everybody that puts a comment below because um, it means people are watching and caring about the videos. And that's what drives me to, to make the next one. Um, like you, you've got an amazing community that you've built up. Um, and regardless of how well a video does, you're still engaging with people and you've got a bit of community. You've got, you know, the tennis nerds with you. So it's it's great. Yeah, that, that's the thing that makes it more worthwhile. I think it's the connecting with people. I mean, there's some trolls, obviously, but not, I think, relatively speaking to other niches, it's, it's not so bad in tennis. Like, you know, you're going to get them anywhere you go. And in some, you know, areas, you're going to get more. But it's that connection with actually tennis fans. And we, we have the same passion. So it, it should be easy to connect over that. You know, it should be easy to to talk to other people because you can talk about, you know, Alcaraz or you can talk about rackets or you can talk about what to eat when you play tennis. There's so many topics around tennis that is also kind of connecting us um, on, on a daily basis. So that's very cool. But it, it's a grind. Yeah. And I think the only way and I see this with like some people ask me, like, oh, I try to do this and, um, you know, I don't see anything after X amount of time. You need to do it from your own passion. Like you can't do this based on looking at data or expecting to make money. It's the same with podcasting. I talked uh, about this topic with another, like I don't make any money from the podcast, like zero, right? Zero money. And I do it because I like talking to people and connect with people. That's, that's it. Otherwise, you know, you give up things straight away. It's like fitness. If, if you start doing fitness and you're starting from a bad place, it's going to take a long time before you're actually feeling the benefits uh, of doing fitness. But when you are getting there, it's, beautiful right so i i think it's like that patience thing is quite important when you're doing youtube you know 100 percent, 100 percent. um and i think the the thing that stops most people is the patience they want to see views and clicks and that and that doesn't happen even even you see channels that have been going for years and years and years that have a huge following there can be stages where all of a sudden the algorithm doesn't like them anymore and and they they don't get views and and um I was I was recently watching um, Ian Westman's videos, uh, Central Tennis, and you know he's had a real struggle recently. And and you know I watch his videos, and and they they're great, but he he's had a real dip, and it, it can be tough, um, you know, if if you're focused too much on on the numbers. So um, I think the key is just enjoy the process. It's like it's like tennis. You, if you're focusing on your results, if you're focusing on getting ranking points, it's going to be a slog because you're going to lose most weeks. Uh, if you're focusing on the development side and the process, then that you're onto a winner. I think so. And I think that's one reason, like, I, I, I know I do things sometimes a bit substandard, like where they're editing or thumbnails or whatever, but I think I like to be in control of doing it and seeing it as kind of a personal growth journey or something. Then that's when you, when you start bloating and, and start like spending money on like editing or cooler, whatever. I think then it becomes more of a stress, like, oh, this video needs now to perform 30K. Uh, while if I'm doing it, okay, I'm investing time, but that's up to me, right? So if I, I, I could watch Netflix, but instead I did two hours of editing. And for me, that's better time spent. Uh, so that's a time investment I can make and, and stand behind. But I think sometimes when you start bloating up and having a lot of like staff, then it becomes tricky, even if it's just like freelancers on an hour basis. Definitely. And it's the danger of your hobby becoming a job, isn't it? You know, the hobby you enjoy, um, when it becomes a job, it's, it's very, very different. Yeah, same with same with tennis. I think I think sometimes that transition, uh, you can see it from players like or you know they love tennis in college or they love tennis as a rec thing. Oh, I'm gonna go pro, and then then it's like things change as soon as you start adding like financial pressure on things. Like things things change uh, for the worse. But like if we look at next year now or this year actually, sorry, it's 2024. Uh, what are your plans? Like last year you did a lot of traveling. We met up in Paris. Uh, which was great. Uh, I hope to be able to travel a little bit myself. Uh, do you have anything planned already or is something that you're kind of starting to plan right now? To be honest, I don't have an awful lot planned. Um, last year was a, a whirlwind and um, lots of these things, as you know, come up quite last minute. So it's it's quite sporadic in this world. I don't know whether it's because the, 
the tennis industry are a little bit behind and maybe less organized than, than other industries. But um, yeah, like I didn't find out about these opportunities until a few weeks before. So it was, it was tough for me and the, the coaching program. I'm lucky to have a supportive team of coaches that can, you know, look after the program when I'm away. But yeah, this year um, I'm, I'm expecting to do some bits at Wimbledon and the, and the British tournaments. Um, I haven't got anything abroad booked in at the moment. Um, but I, I'd love to to do some some more traveling. Not probably a bit less than than last year. Um, but yeah, I haven't got I haven't got too much in the diary. How about yourself? No, it's the same. Like it, it, this is the thing that I, it frustrates me quite literally. Like it's like this, <laughs> this industry is always like, oh, we're gonna release. Oh, we we released a racket. Maybe we should talk to someone who reviews rackets. That would be a great <laughs> idea. Maybe we should send you. Hey, hey, um, we like your channel. And now we have a racket that's already out, you know, like, well, you could have sent it a month before, give me time to do a, a proper review. Uh, that's also better for you. Like, uh, these things happens all the time. The same with the events, like, okay, you know, two weeks before, oh, would you like to come to the French Open? You're like, uh, well, I would, but maybe I have things planned. Maybe I need to take other things. I mean, you're coaching. Uh, you might be in a different part of the world and you already have a trip planned. So, yeah, I, I would have loved to have a, a finished calendar now or for at least three months you know where it's like oh i'm going to indian wells you know I, even i tried to apply for a press pass because i wanted to go to the states i haven't been in a, a bunch, bunch of years now and there's no chance right so no chance brands are not doing any activation where they like invite you so it's like yeah it's, it's tricky it's tricky and then i know coming some you know european clay court swing maybe yeah, you get some invites or something but it's it, it's good if it's not last minute you know because they're not paying like a, a whole lot of money. This industry, tennis industry, is is cheapo. You know, it's cheapo.com. You know, so it's like they, they, it's not going to be like a generous spread of things compared to other. I mean, if if you think people listening think that it's like oh, glamorous life, I could say having worked in as a chief marketing officer for some online companies, this is not glamorous life. It's, a tennis, <laughs> it's tennis life. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we do it for the love, and that's the only reason you, you know, it, it does look glamorous from the outside. But I think um, if people saw the amount of work that went into it when, when you're away on these things, it's it's not quite so easy. You actually don't get to enjoy the tennis that you're going to watch as much as you would if you're watching it on TV. No, it's true. It's funny. Like, you're working so much, doing things, like trying to record, and you, you do, like, interviews with players or do some, like, activation with the brand. Uh, and and then then that's the whole day just like boom and like oh I did I saw five minutes of tennis you know so it's just which was like the whole thing oh, I'm excited I'm gonna watch uh, Alcaraz or whatever uh, sometimes the events are really well organized I mean the Adidas one we went to was really good I must say give them props for that um, and we got to watch uh, I, you didn't watch Alcaraz that that trip I guess but I, I got to watch it which was great. Uh, but sometimes, yeah, you feel like it's a little bit rushed. So uh, so it's up and down. Uh, not all brands uh, do a great job. Not all brands do a bad job. But it, it's like you do it for the fun and the love of the sport. Yeah, it's not like a monetary, like, wow, <laughs> I would say. Totally. Yeah, totally. But it's, um, you, like I said at the start, I think for me, as a tennis fan, as well as a coach and a player, like it's really, really cool to go to these events. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't think I'd get to go to the French Open, the US Open. So I'm very grateful for that. But as you say, it's not as glamorous as it as it looks. Yeah, I think so. I, I know um, like also people at, think like they think oh you have a dream job like you're testing rackets you have a whole room full of rackets which i do it's i have to organize better stringing machine to the right here it's some measuring machine it's like a crazy tennis uh, life but it's 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 also a work like a lot of work but it, it's it's much better than sitting in an office so I'm, I'm happy about that you know that's pretty good and i i would assume that that's your also your answer that you get to be on a tennis court and connect with with players every day it must be a, a blessing in it in a way right absolutely i think um the variety for me is the key to enjoying what I do. And um, you mentioned before about traveling, you know, being a tour coach. And I think as as cool as that sounds, and I think, you know, it, it would be nice to do at some point for a spell. Um, I think I would miss the variety of teaching tots, teaching, you know, the, the, the silver players and, you know, all, all of these things that I do as well as filming editing going on trips like the variety is the spice of life as they say and i think having the the mixture of things is is only good yeah it's true and that's a great note to end on you're such a passionate coach great guy and uh i know you have a busy schedule you're going to coach i'm actually going to play some tennis so that's good looking forward to that it's always fun uh but so what's what's on your uh, schedule for today so i'm gonna log off from this call head down to the tennis club i've got 
four one-to-one sessions. Um, then I've got lunch break, late lunch. Um, and then I've got three group sessions in the evening. So um, busy down court. It's pretty grim weather in the UK at the moment. We I was coaching outdoors in the rain yesterday. And yeah, today's a little bit better, but it's uh, we need a, a roof on our tennis courts. Yeah, yeah, we need to do a fundraiser to get a roof because it looks like a really nice uh, venue you're at, right? It does look really nice on. Yeah, on... in the summer it's amazing. We're we're very fortunate to have ten grass courts, which um, I'd love to get you down. You know, if you're here in the summer in the UK, we'll, we'll have a little hit on the grass courts. Um, but yeah, it's just obviously tough, tougher in the winter. We've got this artificial clay surface, which is incredible when it does get wet. Um, but yeah, roof would be nice. Yeah, yeah. No, it looks look great. And I hope Wimbledon will happen. So then I can maybe, I don't know how far you are away from it, a few hours. About an hour and a half, but um, I'll, I'm going to maybe try to get an Airbnb down there. So to spend a bit more time. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, Ash. It's been great as usual. And uh, we keep in touch and best of luck with the course. Bulletproof at the baseline with David Samuel. That's cool. And uh, you can check out Tennis Mentor. I'm going to put you all your links in the description as, as usual. Thank you so much, Ernst. It's been awesome chatting to you. And I'm sure uh, we'll, we'll get another one in the diary again soon because I've, uh, I've really enjoyed it.